<laughs> okay, so as the group talked about, we are now with Haggai, Nehemiah, uh, Zechariah, Malachi, all these other prophets. We're now occupying post-exilic Israel. Okay, Everything that we've looked at so far has been the threat of exile or being in exile, and now the Israelites are returning home. And the reason for this, as we kind of talked about at the end of our last class, is um, after Babylon kind of, you know, ends up being the new dominant world power during that time, they, just like Assyria, become overextended, eventually get weaker, and a new power rises, and that's Persia. Okay? Persia becomes the new world power in that region. Okay, sorry. Uh, the dates that we're looking at here are around 539 BCE. Okay, this is when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon for Persia. Now, Cyrus has an incredibly different tactic than the Babylonians did. The Babylonians' tactic was once you have come in and conquered a people, you then exile them, right? When, if you exile them, you scatter them abroad, and they no longer have a, a force that they can unify to rise up against you, mm -hmm. right? Cyrus has a very different tactic, and it's almost kind of a Roman tactic. And what he does is instead of saying, no, we're going to destroy your temples and scatter you all abroad. He kind of tries to get the people on Persia's side. So he allows all of the exiles to return to their homelands and tells the Israelites and all these other groups of people who have been exiled that they can now practice their religion, right? their native religion. He even helps fund the rebuilding of the temple. Cyrus right? does. Cyrus does. Exactly. So he's basically, I'm your friend. You know? Exactly. <laughs> so he allows this return to people's homeland and rebuilding of temples. Right? In a sense, he's seen as the kind of the, the polar opposite of Pharaoh. I'm sorry, I know you said it like three times, but you said Osiris allows people to return to their homeland and what? And rebuild their temples. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so this is when the Israelites return to the land, and this is actually where we get the term Jew or Jewish from. Because now that, that little chunk of land that was Judah and Israel is now referred to as, oops, try it again, Yehud. Mm. <clears throat> right? And so those who live in Yehud are Yehudi. Right? <laughs> and this is where we get this is where we get the term G from. Okay. So it's not up until this time that we really can refer to the people living in Israel and Judah as being Jewish. So the place is Jehud and the people are the Jehud. The Yehudi, yeah, exactly. This is why I've been constantly refer trying to refer to them as the Israelites. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, was uh, mm -hmm. so okay. this, uh, Jehu, that's that's the country. This this is, is the land, and it's that's Judah and Israel, the whole country together, right? They're not separate. I believe so. Yeah. Well, it's just it's it's kind of you know the borders are, are kind of constantly shifting, and um, and yeah, so the the, the land that they are allowed to go back to. It's kind of analogous to that same region. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed, you know, in a lot of these maps that there aren't exactly incredibly clear borders the way that we would map them out today. You know. So, the people return, and this and this is when we enter what's called the post-exilic period, right? It's right there. I'm not going to write it. It's also referred to, what I will write, is the second temple period. This era? Yeah. I'm sorry everything is apparently <laughs> slanted today. <laughs> this is the second temple period. And this starts at um, 538 BCE. All of that right 
their times are great. Yeah. Uh, that was yeah. This this is his. Thing. This is what he kind of inaugurates. Okay. The second temple period. Right. right. That's not the second temple period. Say that one more time. But uh, what if you wrote up there? That's not the second temple period, or is that? Or so the second temple period starts because the people are allowed to rebuild the temple. Okay. Right. Because of Cyrus is the great. And it's his decree that the people return and rebuild their temple. Oh, this outcome. Yeah, right. yeah. And you know, a lot of this stuff is, I mean, this is kind of historians looking back. It's not like people are like, yeah, we're in the second temple period. You know, this is just kind of looking back. People, people say, okay, the temple's rebuilt. We can refer to this chunk of time mm -hmm. as the second temple period. Okay. Until it gets destroyed in 70 by the uh, Romans. Okay. <laughs> so, so then this is the second temple period. What, you all right? Uh, that was just funny. Yay. Yay, we're in the second temple period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> During this time, we have in Judah, in Yehud, what is referred to as a diarchy. Okay. Diarchy. Okay. Think of you have a monarchy. How many people rule in a monarchy? One. One. How many people rule in a dire uh, Two. Two. <laughs> right? Who were our two, two rulers? We, we kind of, do you remember their names? <laughs> right. <laughs> we have, so I'm going to try my best to spell them. Zerubbabel and Joshua. Right? Now, keep in mind that these rulers aren't as autonomous as you would say, um, you know, a president would be. They are still, in a sense, under the thumb of, of the Persians, right? You'll, you'll read in a lot of these books that it will refer to Cyrus, it will often refer to King Darius, right? These are Persian rulers that are still technically in charge, right? But they've but they're allowing the people to kind of set up their own systems again. Yeah. Did the, um, did Cyrus put these guys in? How did they get to the people? They, I, I'm fairly the sure that they are kind of elected by the people, okay. or not elected. Zerubbabel, if if you are returning, right? If you are the the Israelites, the Jewish people returning from exile, whose family are you going to look to? To rule. Mm -hmm. who, who are you going to put on the throne? Who's gonna? Whose family are you going to look to to put on the throne? Yeah, Zerubbabel is of Davidic descent. Right. Here you have one who is in the line of King David. Right. So you guys remember all those kind of messianic hopes. Right, the Messiah is just one who is anointed, who you yes. anoint with the king. Kings come from David's line. All the messianic hopes get put here on Zerubbabel. Okay, mm. here, here it is. Right, David's lineage is starting again. Right, You'll, we'll see prophecies that will that um, prophets will say all the other kings will be kind of wiped out, and David's line will continue through Zerubbabel. Right. Doesn't unfortunately doesn't come to pass. <laughs> Joshua. So here we have our our political side of things. Joshua is the priest, right? So Joshua is going to be in charge of all the priestly matters. Okay, and this is the kind of uh, political system in Judah after the exile. So he was from the Levites? The Levites? I, I believe so. So they, in order for them to have a proper hierarchy, they have the king and the priest. The king and the priest. The, the, the amount of David and the amount of the Levites. Yeah, exactly. Now, the, the group did a really good job emphasizing what was the major focus of these prophets. For those who weren't in the group, what was that focus? You guys are good. Yeah. You got it. It was right on. Right? 
there is a huge stress during this time on, we'll call it preserving national identity. You said there's a huge stress? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is the emphasis. <coughs> And one way they do, that, do this is through emphasizing their religious identity. Right, and this is why time and time again we will see prophets calling for a rapid restoration of the temple. Right, don't delay, rebuild this temple. How can you be rebuilding houses for yourselves before you rebuild the temple? Right, now let's kind of consider this, why we, we have, like, every, you know, most, a good number of people went into exile, right? But not everybody is gone. Why would the people who were already in Jerusalem, not, who weren't, who hadn't been sent into exile, why would they not have rebuilt the temple? Fear. Fear of who? Yeah, it's going to be one big thing, right? You don't want to do it because Babylon's in charge. If you try to rebuild this, he's going to come and squash this. What's another reason that might have contributed to why the temple couldn't have been rebuilt? They didn't hear them. They didn't have prophets. Huh? They didn't get the message from the prophets. No, well, I mean, you know, they, they still knew it was important. I mean, was, the prophets come back and say, look, we need to do this because this is important. Right. But, you know, I think, I think Bob was saying that kind of on the head, money. Mm -hmm. Right? This takes, this takes Cyrus funding it. Right? And remember who gets taken out with that first wave of exiles. Right? It's all the, the aristocrats, all the priests, all the people who are upper class. Right? So you're left with a lot of lower class people in Jerusalem and Judah. They're not going to have the funds to rebuild the temple. Right? And so you can imagine all these people returning from exile, though, and saying, why haven't you done this? Right? You, you have, you know, obviously this religious identity is not important to you. Because you haven't even tried to rebuild this. It's taking us, the exiles, coming back to do this. My question is, when they were sent into exile as the upper, you know, far as financial people, mm -hmm. when they get to Babylon, are they not stripped of that prestige? And so when they're sent back, would they still have that same kind of power because mm -hmm. they didn't have their possessions or their, their stuff to go along with that? I mean, there is... I would say there, there would definitely be some status that they would have lost, right, because they're no longer in the same society. Um, but at the same time, it's likely that they were able to take some of their stuff with them, even if they weren't able to take some of their stuff with them. They probably like, probably accumulated goods in exile, and Cyrus is definitely not going to strip them of that as they go back. They may have to know how to do it again, to make that money again. Potentially. 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 Um, they also remember that who they who they were because um like we, like you said with the diarchies diarchies they had to have the king that had to come from the line of David mm -hmm. and, and they had the priest who was the Levi so they had to remember that they did that the, of the original covenant you know with the line of David so mm -hmm. that they were going to be rebuilding and preserving national um, national identity they had the religious and still brought back to their mind okay, these people are still descendants, even though they got taken out, they're still descendants, so we got to try to work with that, is that what that was? Yeah, I mean, you're going to see, like, what we see and what um, folks like Ezra and Nehemiah show us is there's a huge conflict that arises between the people who are left in the land, mm -hmm. right, and the people that get taken out, yeah. right, kind of like we've, we've looked at a little bit, um, and and I'll, I'll go to that in just a second, but there is this, you know, when the people come back into the land, you see in the prophets this huge push to to stir this up, you know, to gird it up, to like say, like, okay, we need to preserve this national identity. How do we do this? Okay, let's rebuild Jerusalem. Let's rebuild the temple, All right? Because that's we need to kind of, you, in a sense, right? They're reestablishing the kind of they, they're seeking to reestablish the cultic life that was lost, right? You're thrown into exile. You no longer have the temple. Oh, now we're back in our homeland. Let's get the temple. Let's get the priesthood back. You see time and time again these prophets calling for tithing, right? Let's just kind of re-energize this cultic life that we lost because we were in exile. Okay. 
Okay, so you see that a lot. Um, how, how long would they get exiled at this point? Was it 586 that they went in? Yeah, so remember our first northern exiles were in yeah, 722? And then 586. Yeah. And they're returning in 539, 538. Well, five, sorry, it would be more 538, just to clarify that. 539 is when Cyrus conquers Babylon. So like I said, in Ezra, we see this huge religious focus in Haggai. Um, you, he has this kind of message that the difficulties in the land, right, as these exiles are returning, are due to God's displeasure that this isn't happening fast enough. Um, in Zechariah, you have uh, a huge elevation of Joshua's status. Right, this emphasis for priests, this religious identity, right? You, we've got a huge emphasis on Sabbath observance. So we can come over here to religious, include things like, so we have temple, rebuilding, we have tithing, um, Sabbath observance, right? Kind of re-energizing this cultic life. Okay. Now, another thing they do that's kind of difficult to read for modern ears um, is uh, how do I want to put this? Um, kind of they push for ethnic purity. So here's a, here's a nice big chunk. This is from Nehemiah. I'm not going to read through all of it, but we see him here saying, you know, he returned and he saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, right? They spoke different languages. So I contended with them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. <laughs> and I made them take an oath in the name of God saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for sons or for yourselves. Did not King Solomon of Israel sin on account of such women? Um, among the many nations, there was no king like him, blah, blah, blah. Nevertheless, foreign women made it even him to sin. Right? Think back to why uh, the the southern kingdom fell, and how there's some of this emphasis on had Solomon not had these foreign wives, right, and brought in these different cults, these different religions, it wouldn't have fallen, right? This is what, this is a huge push as Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, especially those two, this, this push against what is called, if I can find my pen, Exogamy. And this is marriage outside of one's group. No marriage outside. Yeah, you cannot marry outside of your group. Right? Of your, yeah, of your like ethnic group. So outside of Israel. Exogamy. Yeah, exogamy. That's how that's pronounced. Right? Um, he goes on to say, they have defiled the priesthood, thus I cleanse them from everything foreign. Right? So we see here this, this kind of emphasis of ethnic purity and we'll say ethnic purity equals religious purity, right? To marry outside of Israel is to marry with people of foreign cults, of foreign religions. You defile and make unclean Israel by having these foreign relations, right? And think about this, the people in exile are very much probably gonna stick among themselves, right? Being in exile, a lot of them are going to like kind of stay in their own group. I mean, think about, you know, if you've ever been, you know, a, a small group amongst a lot of people you don't know, you kind of cluster with people you know, mm -hmm. and who look familiar or look the same or have similar interests, right? You're gonna cluster. That's kind of what the what the exiles did. Whereas the people in the land, kind of being left left alone, started having and forming families 
with people from neighboring countries. And we can see in Ezra, for example, the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the exile celebrate the de dedication of this house of God with joy, talking about the temple. Another part in Ezra, for they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons. Thus the holy seed has mixed itself with the peoples of the land, and in the faithfulness, faithlessness of the officials and leaders have led the way. See what kind of two groups we have here. Right? We have the children of the exile. And this idea of the holy seed mixing with the peoples of the land. Right? The holy seed is Israel. Right? Now, the question for the prophets is, is this holy seed pure as it is with the children of the exile? Or has it become mixed with the peoples of the land? Right? What's that? Right. And that's what these prophets coming in from outside are going to say, look, we almost laugh, lost our identity as a people right? by being thrown into exile. We cannot have that identity threatened or just flip out of existence by just becoming intermarried with other people. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, would that be, for instance, we talked about <coughs> people outside of Israel being unclean, like, you know, when they got in trouble, they would get put out of the, out of the, the focus group. Is that what you mean? Like, is that the reason that they can't mix with other nations? In a sense, I mean, like, I think ideas of cleanliness and purity come into this, right? There's this holy seed that is getting mixed with people who are not holy, right? The thing, I mean, you know, take the perspective of the exiles who are coming back, right? Somehow we survive, right? We are still a people group. Let's rebuild this temple. Let's reestablish ourselves in our identity and who we are, um, reestablishing this cultic life, right? And coming back and seeing that the people that are still in the land have now started intermarrying with other people and kind of, in a sense, diluting that national identity that you're working so hard to reestablish, right? And that's why we see these prophets kind of time and again and during the post-exilic period coming out so strongly and vehemently and fright frighteningly sometimes against anxiety. Yeah. Um, so is, is that the syncretism, syncretism you or what is that? Is that? It's, so the syncretism is, is the combining of religions, okay. right? And that's what the prophets are worried is going to happen. If, if people take these foreign wives, then they're going to fall into the same trap that Solomon did, right? King Solomon of Israel sinned on account of such women, right? We could read on account of such marriages, right? We're losing that identity of, of the people of God because we're now intermingling with other people who have different religions. And so monotheism, right, itself, right, this, this cult of Yahweh is threatened by the syncretism that's a result of in these intermarriages. Exactly. So they were spiritually savory. They were trying to be, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. 